Welcome. I'm Dr. Zegley Brown from the Department of English Literature and Creative Writing at Lancaster University. On the department's part one course, World Literature, we discuss Inglit's dependence on works produced in languages other than English and media other than writing, for example, graphic novels. In general, World Literature asks how ideas of Englishness are both formed and transformed by literal and figurative concepts of translation. An important text for the course is Ovid's extraordinary poem, The Metamorphosis, a word which the Oxford English Dictionary defines as the action or process of changing in form, shape or substance, especially transformation by supernatural means. Though dictionaries limit literary analysis and should be used with great caution, for my purposes here, the OED's definition sums up of its use of the word pretty well. Originally produced in Emperor Augustus's Rome in around 8 AD, the 11,000 lines or so of Ovin's Latin verse, divided into 15 books, covers approximately 220 different classical myths in one seamless narrative. While we warmly invite you to read the poem in full, the first year course World Literature focuses on a few key extracts, and they are from book one, the creation, the four ages, the flood. Also from book one, the episode concerning Apollo and Daphne. And then from book three, the episode concerning Echo and Narcissus. Today, I'm using the translation of the Metamorphosis by Frank Justice Miller, revised by G.P. Gould and published by Harvard University Press in 1984 in two volumes and you can see the books behind me there they're the two little red ones just by the z so here are some questions to ask when reading of his metamorphosis for world literature english 101 so the first question you might ask yourself is how can i read and analyze short fragments of such a long poem well we know that the entire poem is called metamorphosis that is the action or process of changing in form, shape or substance, especially transformation by supernatural means. We know that. Now, notably, the poem's opening line is, my mind is bent to tell of bodies changed into new forms. So that's the Metamorphosis, book one, line one. This conceit of change will drive Robert's account from the creation of the world out of chaos to its final metamorphosis the foundation of Rome and the apotheosis of Julius Caesar. The familiar historical figure that's involved in the events that led to the fall of the Roman Republic and the rise of the Roman Empire. And just to gloss that term apotheosis, it just means a, a transformation of a mortal being into a, into a deity. In the opening books of his poem, Ovid shows how mortals are subject to the often violent and sexual whims of the gods. And as the poem moves forward to Ovid's own day, those gods recede into the background, but they're still there. One of the Ovidian myths discussed in our world literature course is the one about Echo and Narcissus from book three. This episode is concerned with the transformation of two mythic figures, a, a nymph and a beautiful youth, into two worldly things, an echo and the Narcissus flower. And as you read the myth, I want you to think about Ovid's representation of authority and creativity and ask why is one metamorphosed mythic figure allowed to retain a solid form while the other one becomes an immaterial repetition of sounds? The first complete English translation of Ovid's poem was by the Elizabethan writer Arthur Golding in 1567, and it soon became an important intertext for 16th century English authors. Um, Golding's translation uh, is often called Shakespeare's Ovid, and uh, we'll talk a bit more about that um, in the lecture that I give you on, on the metamorphosis. Given the nature of its brutal and erotic subject matter, of its poem was considered unsuitable for women to translate. In fact, the first published translation in English was a prose version by Mary Innes in 1955. 
it's hard to believe that Stephanie McCarter is currently working on the first complete verse translation by Woman to be published. Now, this point brings me to my second set of questions. So I want you to think about the translation you're reading. What's its date? Who produced it and where? One of the most notable fragments of the Metamorphosis to be translated into English is Phyllis Wheatley's rendition of the bereaved mother Niobe, uh, which appears in book six. Born in Senegal, Gambia in 1753, at the age of about eight, Wheatley was enslaved and educated in a wealthy Bostonian household. She's the first African-American author of a published book of poetry, and that was called Poems on Various Subjects, Religious and Moral, which was published in 1773. Wheatley's anthology contains her poem, Niobe in Distress for Her Children, Slain by Apollo, from Ovid's Metamorphosis Book 6, and from a view of the painting of Mr Richard Wilson. Her classical translation, then, is clearly produced from mixed media source texts, Ovid's poem and Wilson's artwork. And this is how Wheatley's version of Ovid's Niobe begins. Apollo's wrath to man, the dreadful spring of ills, innumerous, tuneful goddess sing. Thou who didst first the ideal pencil give, and taught the painter in his works to live. Inspire with glowing energy of thought what Wilson painted and what Ovid wrote. Muse, lend thy aid, nor lend me sue in vain though last and meanest of thy rhyming train. O oh, guide my pen in lofty strains to show the Phrygian queen, all beautiful in woe. The poem's long title, invoking male creativity, followed by Wheatley's address to the muse, encourages, I think, a 21st century reader to ask, what kinds of power structures influence this 18th century Ovid produced by a woman of colour? Why would she reference Ovid and Wilson? To what extent is Wheatley's Naomi a site of authority and resistance? Translations are influenced by the social and cultural context in which they're produced. And my third and final question for what to ask when reading Ovid's Metamorphosis is to uh, ask you to think about the relevance of Ovid's poem now. Following the three ages known as the Golden, Silver and Bronze Ages, Ovid's fourth and final age is an age of hard iron. In English translation, Ovid's description continues, straight away all evil burst forth into this age of baser vein, Modesty and truth and faith fled the earth, and in their place came tricks and plots and snares, violence and cursed love of gain. To end then, I'd like to ask, how would you create a version of Ovid's Iron Age, which speaks to your peers in September 2020? What specific social and or political events might influence your translation? I hope you find these questions useful for reading and thinking about Ovid's Metamorphosis. And I really look forward to meeting the week one's introduction to world literature. Thank you.